Here we go. Welcome, everybody. I want to thank you all for being here for Habitat Now. And um, I want to thank our guests of honor, uh, Leah Wingfield and Stephen Clements, for joining us. They're going to give us a presentation about uh, their lives and work and their new process. So uh, to start off the presentation, I'm going to show a couple of videos, uh, or a video, of, of Leah's work with a little bit of uh, uh, music behind it, so there's no real dialogue. So just uh, relax and enjoy, and we'll get started right now. So I'm going to take over your screen. I'm going to see a picture of my boy uh, on my other screen before I start playing the presentation. All right, three, two, make sure my audio is working. Share and here we go. Thank you. 
great. Thank you, Leah, for sharing that. That was a little bit of everything, wasn't it? A little bit. Okay, you ready for me? Yep, I have stopped sharing. You're welcome to take over and start sharing on your, on your end. Okay, I'm hoping I get this right. This is the uh, first time for me on this, Good. so there we go. Click on the uh, slide button and you should be- Are you seeing? We're seeing, seeing the right thing? Yep, you gotta click on that little button in the lower left hand, right hand corner that makes it a slideshow. Or start slideshow should be some way to do that. Actually, I'm gonna do it manually, so. You do, okay, well yeah. you do it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I think we're ready to roll. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here. We're, we're really excited and we appreciate it so much. And um, I have a little shout out for Mrs. Slollinger. If you're here, you know who you are. Thank you for coming. So what we want to talk about today is uh, some of the recurring themes that we use in our work. And We'll take you through a lot of our thought processes. We'll take you through the, some of the pieces that occur as a result and um, mix in some of the, the um, actual process, a few process slides so you can kind of get a sense of how things progress. Um, and this is a lot of where it starts. Um, we are asking the questions you know, we're around making an attempt to understand how to use the mind to deal with the winds that blow through our lives and come without warning. And we're trying to think about how do we balance understanding, escape, beauty, and often unbeauty. And so, you know, we basically seem to always be asking the question, what the hell do we do to keep our heads on straight when we get hit by tsunamis? And so these are some of the answers we come up with. We start trying to build character. We go into our memories and try to discover the mechanics of those memories. We are always looking for the keys to unlock the power to come and go without hindrance at all times, to seek inspiration and answers and just some strength. We're always trying to balance our heart against the weight of a feather. This is a fable that's used in many, many culture, cultures to inspire thoughts around how are you gonna end up? If your heart is lighter than a feather, then you will ascend. If your heart is heavier than a feather, then you are more than likely to descend. We're always looking for the window to open up the light in our heads when they get really tangled. And we feel that coming together provides the antidote to quiet things down when there's a tsunamis all around us. And it's another kind of recurring theme for us is um, we think about how, how do we use our, our relationship, our relationship to um, calm the storms, handle them, you know, keep, keep them at bay or put our heads down and go, go into them. Over this last couple of years, I, although I've always worked in heads, and I, I love making heads, I'm obsessed with them, I started to really work on developing a more realistic style, which led us to this series um, that we called Wild Dreaming oh, about, I don't know, two or three years ago. And what we're thinking about here is a uh, a really very interior moment and we're trying to capture that time when we're daydreaming and we have actually found the key to open our mind um, so that we can come and go without hindrance and these are often really private moments um, 
and they're, they're a flow state. Things are open, everything's possible. The edges have melted away, the boundaries, and we've actually found the key. Um, it's a symbol that we use a lot in, in our work um, for that idea of opening the mind to ideas, possibilities, um, in a sense, kind of getting into and out of our heads. It's a, it can be a really calm moment. That's kind of, you know, when you capture it and you realize you've been staring out the window and you've been really calm and open. Um, Steve calls my head a snow globe. He said, it's, you know, it's like you shake it up all the time and then we just sort of, you know, see what lands <laughs> and, what, and what, what drops out. And so for me, these moments are really valued. And then we started to move beyond this interior moment and think of it um, as something that expands and we start to let outside world, the outside world in, outside influences in. And part of what I'm showing you as I'm starting to introduce these waxes that you'll see intermittently is something that we're challenged with, which is to translate from a really dense material to the transparent material and um, that we end up with in glass. So I'm also, as we move through this um, presentation, I'm trying to also give you that sense and, and build that for you. So you can see here that you know the wax has its own beauty and there are moments throughout the whole process where um as the piece is you know working its way to the end vision um that what you have right then is you know really great and would be a nice place to stop um i find that often in the wax you know it's it looks really different and it's its own beauty i just haven't figured out how to preserve it in a way that i could send it to you and it would actually get there and not be melted and so with this next series, continuing this idea of dreaming, um, we titled the overall series, um, Distant Dreams. And this is where we're introducing the outside world and we're thinking about time, memory, history, and how do we access those things to expand our minds, find answers, find inspiration. We really thought that it was, um, interesting to consider where what are some of the tools for that and for us um, books were sort of an obvious idea that before we had our modern world and all of this instantaneous incessant access it was things like books and then radios that really opened up the world to us and so when we found, started to find some of these old radios, we realized that that was sort of a very pivotal moment for bringing the world into our homes. Um, first books brought them into our, brought the outside world into our lives and then radios. And we thought that that would be a really interesting thing to um, convey this story. This radio jumps ahead a few generations the title of this is Girl with the Faraway Eyes, which is a Rolling Stones song from Some Girls, not from the 1940s. <laughs> Got it. And so we use, um, we also, a, a symbol that we like to use a lot is the compass. And that is a symbol of movement, um, again, experiencing the, the world, um, finding ideas, um, searching. We think about searching a lot, searching for those answers, searching for those strengths. We thought a lot about um, the books that we used and um, we found some really cool books with re very interesting stories and inscriptions within them. We found books that referenced art, um, as you saw, and then we thought about, um, we found old travel books and thought about, you know, that, I mean, we, we just go everywhere and it's so, everything's so accessible and so instant. And to, to look back into those books and see how rare 
and unique it was to be able to experience these places, um, the effort that it took. Uh, we really wanted to tap into that um, with this idea of time travel. The history of art, very important. Um, we really like to symbolize time with the hourglass. Um, that's another sort of recurring idea for us. And, and again, that, that idea of appreciating um, the continuum um, that happens when you access um, history. And for me personally, that's um, an important thing for me to remember because I tend to want to look to the future all the time and move forward, forward, forward and can forget how to appreciate um, what's gone before and be part of the continuum of ideas. And um, again, the compass, um, searching for that true north. You know, where do we belong? Where, where are we headed for? How do we get there? How do we get there? Kind of constant questions. And then um, this brings us forward to uh, the most recent series, which kind of brings it all together into storms. And even though I, I feel like we made these pieces a little ahead of their time because we um, showed them originally last year, and I think they're really appropriate for now. <laughs> um, and speaking of tsunami, and so, um, I'll take you through this piece a little, just quickly from the beginning. Um, you got a little taste of it in, in the video um, when you toured our home and studio. And um, again, this is where it starts and we start with the, the wax and we are having to imagine into the future, um, you know, what, what we want to end up with. And so one of the decisions we made here and the things we explored is I really wanted to get a lot of movement into the hair. I, I was making big hair and, um, you know, kind of wild hair, which I really wanted, but I wanted to get air in there. I wanted to get the sense of it getting blown around like our hair does. And we landed on this idea of using glass shards. And so the experiment was can we insert the shards right into the wax and then cast it? And this was the first one that we um, attempted and we were really relieved and happy that it worked so that once the wax was evacuated from the mold, we introduced the, the, gla the glass that made the body and they fused together. And so this is um, the piece right out of the mold and before any grinding and cleaning has, has occurred. But you can see that the really cool thing is that all of that shard work was preserved exactly as we um, inserted it. And um, here we come to the finished piece where Steve has made this wood boat that we look at as uh, another symbol that we use for equilibrium. Um, the boat takes us places, it protects us, it um, helps us preserve balance, except on a few days on the lake when it doesn't. Um, but the, the other idea here is that with all of this crazy tsunami that's going on and these storms um, that we're trying to preserve equilibrium with the boat and an expression of calm that even though there's all of this scary activity happening, on, happening, that this interior calm is what helps us navigate these storms. Now, this is something that the universe has never seen before, which is Steve Clements cutting glass <laughs> over and over. Who the thought? <laughs> over and over and over and over. And Having started blowing glass in 1968, I didn't know how to cut a piece of glass. <laughs> Not until that moment that you just saw. <laughs> and 
And these pieces actually, you know, I have to confess, they were incredibly tedious. I mean, we have hundreds of shards in these things. And yet um, we actually both really enjoyed making them. We love them. And we were surprised, we surprised ourselves. We were really patient with the process. And it was just really interesting. Um, this is that piece we were working on that is, I'm just um, excavating it from the mold. And this is another example of a moment in the progression of the piece where I looked at this and I thought, oh my God, this would be such a cool piece. Just yeah, like I was this. just thinking the same thing. I'm like, it looks amazing. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I cannot figure out how to preserve this either <laughs> in the plaster and get it to the gallery in, in one piece. But it, it, I'm trying to give you a sense of our path and, and what we see in, as we're moving through the work. And that at any given moment, I, I often am thinking, okay, I could just stop right here. I'm done, happy. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I have a confession to make that um, I would really pr be pretty much satisfied, satisfied with the wax and ready to move on to the next one. The discipline for me personally comes in actually getting it to this point. <laughs> Because if I had my own way, as much as I love these finished pieces, um, I would, you know, I'm lazy. I would be pretty much happy just stopping at the wax. And again, we're trying to show here an expression of interior calm, even though the base is knocked off balance and is a bit precarious. Um, you know, the, our hair is a mess. And the message is, you know, sometimes we just have to go out with that messy hair and face the wind and get on with it. It's beautiful work. These are some of our, our favorites. We're really excited about this series. This is, um, a piece that we did recently um, that is, uh, was given the theme frontier. And we addressed it by thinking about the, this physical frontier, this little space between people at their first kiss. And so this is a really, really romantic piece. And we're thinking about the energy and um, the commitment the risk that you take crossing that frontier and then really trying to remember the experience of that first electric charge of connection and um, reliving the vigor of that moment over and over and over. And we just really, really love this moment and, and really like trying to capture, again, those memories. That's where um, the mechanics of memory we come back to that. Now this is um, a peek at a current piece that is underway. And um, here we're exploring the theme of equilibrium. Um, you can see we're back to some of those symbols. Um, we have um, this, you know, little fellow in the boat. And he is um, trying to find his way back. And obviously there's a big wind blowing. And um, we're going to be titling this The Sailor's Muse. And um, it refers to the, um, uh, the, it symbolizes the temptation, desire, and risk that is drawing your ship closer to home. And um, we're, we're looking at the boat as that symbol of adjusting equilibrium, you know, always having to go back and forth, and the hope that lives um, with the muse, the sailor's muse, and that she is um, a solid object to head for. Um, and I'm really, um, again, as, as I said, you know, I'm really obsessed with these heads, and what I'm really trying to find in these heads is um, a really nuanced expression 
it's really easy to express um, a big happiness with a big smile. It's easy to express, you know, the big gestures of like worry or sadness or consternation, but finding those nuanced expressions that we have, you know, those things that happen behind the eyes, that's what's really driving me. And it is really a challenge, really tricky to find. Um, you can see this is the patterning for the, the uh, for cutting out the wood waves that Steve does. And he's on the saw with his handy helper. <laughs> this is how we are setting up um, the proportions. Um, so I've made this um, paper pattern for the hat and this is sort of how we're finding what is the right scale. Um, and then you can sort of see down to the right, we've used an eraser to, as you would, to discover the right um, scale for the, the little guy in the boat, the sailor. This is, um, I'll run you quickly through how I start these heads. Um, it's a particular sort of um, pattern process. And so I have this paper pattern that I lay onto a sheet of wax and um, score it out. And then I cut it and you can see here. And then it becomes this pattern that then goes into that wood box, which is um, I refer to as my easy bake oven. It's just got a light bulb in it and it, it warm, it's a place where I can put the wax and warm it up. And then I fold it into this rough shape. And I sort of go back and forth, it's hollow right now. And so I can sort of uh, impress a little bit of the shape, depress some of the shape. Um, this is exhausting to the dog, as you can see. <laughs> Always a consideration. <laughs> and then we get back to work and really what I'm doing here is developing a skull and I have to tell you I love this stage it's I think it's just so cool looking and it's this such a strange and interesting <clears throat> sensation to move through and develop the skull and I have to stay on my side of the studio in this stage because it totally creeps me out <laughs> <laughs> such a wimp <laughs> And so you can see it's just, I'm moving through, um, adding the features, the muscles, the skin, um, the beginning to get, um, you know, closer and closer to refining. Um, I've refined it a bit more, sort of, you know, bits at a time. It's getting more and more refined until, uh, you know, I've come to the, the finished wax. And one of the characteristics about um, transitioning from the wax to the glass is that w one of the beauties of the wax is that like uh, more typical um, uh, sculpture materials, the opaque materials like stone or clay, is that what it gives you is um, shadows in those opaque materials. And the challenge with glass is that uh, with the light coming through, you lose those shadows. And so um, that is, that's again, sort of a continuing challenge. Um, I use paint um, on them as, you'll, as you've seen and will see to help stop the eye and sort of recreate and accentuate those shadows so that they don't get um, just blasted out by the light that comes through the glass. Um, so we could take a break here, Erin, if you want, if there are any questions. Great idea. Feel free, anybody, to unmute yourself and ask any questions you've been thinking about so far. I, I kind of have a quick question, though. When We haven't seen your reverse mold process. When you were doing the spikes in the head, um, how did you know that the spikes would then again fit uh, back on the head? Or they, would... don't, they, they don't get fitted back. What we've done is they they're um embedded in the wax and then um you'll see i'll show you the steaming process you saw a little bit of that in the video that the the beautiful fiery shot and mm -hmm. the bubbling over pot that's where the the wax is evacuated and so there's a a cavity in the mold 
and the plaster has captured those shards. And so mm -hmm. then we melt the new glass that forms the body into the mold and it fuses with those shards that are already there. Wow, that's pretty impressive. They stay right in place, that's great. So they stay right in place and they fuse. And then when we carefully break the plaster away, that's what I showed you where it maintained them. And that was really cool. <laughs> that's amazing, it's an amazing process. Yeah. It's actually very cool that you, that you got it to work. It's brilliant. <laughs> I know. Can you, Matt, can you believe how smart we were on that day? You're very smart. Shocking. I mean, and I can tell you, it hasn't happened since. <laughs> we haven't been that smart since. We clean out the plaster between the glass shards in the finished product. You have to go really deep to clean all that plaster out. How's that yes, happen? and my secret weapon I found is a water pick. Genius. Yeah. It's very tedious. Like I said, those, those pieces were miraculously tedious and we actually loved <laughs> working on them, which I can't say is often, you know, true. <laughs> Leah, um, how malleable is the plaster compared to say clay or materials like the, um, I'm sorry, the, the wax that you're sculpting with? The wax that, the wax I use is um, a sculpture wax that is, uh, developed to work um, like clay and then and harden. Um, so, it's you know, develop, it's developed for bronze casting. And, you know, there are, it's, it's another material that there's a million kinds that are developed for a lot of different uses. And so this wax, um, when I warm it, I can squish it and work it just like clay, but then it hardens up so that then I can also carve it. And I've been using the same wax for about 30 years, probably. And um, when I'll show you, you know, coming up in some of the process, when I steam the wax out, I catch it on top of the water in the steamer that we've created. And then I take it out, it's a layer on top of the water and I pick it up off the water and then I clean it. And I've been actually reusing that same wax for 30 years over and over and over. That's and occasionally I have to you know, add to it because you lose a little bit, you know, over time, but, but generally I just keep recycling that wax over and over and over. And it's been really effective to me, for me, because um, I prefer to make these uh, one-off pieces because again, I'm quite lazy and I don't really like mold making. So I like to work directly in the wax and then that goes directly into the, the, uh, mold that goes in the kiln. I don't make uh, master molds or rubbers or um, because I don't intend to reproduce them. And, um, and like I said, I'm, I don't really love mold making. It also <laughs> keeps us making one of a kind pieces. Mm -hmm. Thank just you. don't, we'll, we'll do series that may be similar in the feel, but each piece in the series is an original. Do you have a compatibility issue with the two kinds of glass? No, they, they were bullseye. So the shards were bullseye and then the, the melting glass was, was bullseye. Yeah. Even, even though it was shards and billets, it's still compatible. Yeah, so they were, they were uh, we, <laughs> we, we did think to check it first. <laughs> Any more questions? Was I understanding correctly, Leah? Um, it looked like. Hi, Demetra. Hi. The skull was hollow, and then it it remained hollow as you were sculpting the features and everything into it. Is that correct? Or um, well, that that is actually the initial method I used. But no, actually, um, once I get the the skull sort of established, then I you know just stuff a bunch of wax in there and make it solid. And the reason I do that is because. Um, we have all of our uh, formulas for uh, figuring out how much glass to use is based on the weight of the solid wax. Okay. And so that's why I make it solid. Um, if we were going to make it um, a hollow cast piece, if we could figure out how the hell to do that, 
then, um, then I would make the wax hollow so that we get this accurate measurement to, to know how much glass to use. You can, okay. do that. you can do that once the wax is eliminated, just fill the mold up with water and multiply by 2.58 and you've got the amount of glass you need. I know, but Steve, why do I want to deal with filling, up, filling it up with water and dumping it out? The mold weighs 200 pounds. You come do it. <laughs> <laughs> come on over, you're hired. <laughs> what kind of paint do you use? What's that? What, what type of paint do you use? And is that applied at the very end uh, the, as, uh, of your creation? Or do you have to anneal it or put it back? Oh. I just use, I just use regular oil paint, and it goes. It's the last step. Yeah. Very last step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Just regular oil paint. Anybody else? Okay. Shall we move on? Yep. Yeah, if you'll stop sharing, I'll start sharing and get the next movie going. Okay. Hold on just a sec. Where's that? Okay. Should be in one of your. Oh, there we go. Okay, got it. Go. Okay, I'm going to take over the screen, everybody. And I'm going to see my boy again. Let me get it going and get the presentation going. So, this little bit uh, quiet presentation was filmed um, uh, by Leah promoting her uh, Project Tango series that we did last year online that sold out. And so, you may need to turn your volume up a bit to hear it, um, but please enjoy. Sure, oh, they're on. They are. Hello, welcome to the studio. I've invited you here today to tell you about a special project that I'm working on. The working title right now is Project Tango Sexy Dance. I did a series of tango dancers from 1998 until 2000 and then revisited the series in 2006 for a retrospective that I did with Habitat Gallery. And the tango's always been one of um, my most popular series. People still ask me about them today, which is really quite gratifying. So recently I was walking around, literally, and it just popped into my head the idea of revisiting it again. And mm. it just felt right. Working on the tango is a wonderful experience because the dance itself is so unique. I don't think anybody is immune to how evocative this dance is of the rhythm of a love affair. It starts out with attraction. From there, it moves to passion, and then resistance, and then there's some war, and finally there's surrender to the love affair. The story of the tango is so carefully crafted, and each of the steps and all of the music are so specific and so nuanced that to create it in sculpture is an equal challenge. What I'm trying to do is make you hear the music of the bandoneon, which is the accordion-like instrument that is the soul of the tango. And when I'm working on these pieces, that's exactly what I'm trying to feel. I'm trying to feel the emotions. I'm trying to feel the movements in my body. I'm remembering my millions of love affairs and how they started mm -hmm. and progressed and really a appreciating the, the unique beauty of this particular dance. For this project, I've decided to offer a small selection of new pieces and um, they will be available by commission. So I've created for Project Tango Sexy Dance uh, a group of watercolor drawings that will be able to be commissioned from. And when you make the commission, then I will send you the original watercolor drawing as kind of a placeholder. Because as you know, all of these are one of a kind and I don't make any master molds. And they're all made fresh and hot for you. So 
Um, I hope that you will enjoy watching this project progress and that when you see these tango pieces that they will bring back for you the memories of all of your millions of love affairs and that you will remember those emotions and those passions. Thanks. Bye. That was great, Leah. You're welcome to take control back again. Okay, here I go. <clears throat> okay, welcome back. Um, so, um, as Aaron said, um, last year uh, we initiated um, what we are calling ground floor projects. And um, we started with um, this first one, which is uh, Project Tango. And um, I gave you the that was sort of our um, initial promotion video to put the project out there. And um, it was very exciting, the, the response. Um, and one of the things that I think um, the collectors who chose to commission these pieces um, reveal is that they remain forever young feeling the emotions of the tango all through their life. I think it's the story that it tells within their collection. And um, I'm going to take you through several um, stages of the process. Um, one of the first stages is that I go looking for images. Um, one of the things that's really helpful is film and um, photography for the tango, especially because um, you can't stop the action. Um, from there, I created drawings um, that were the vehicle to commission from. And so the drawings um, are, ex are my interpretation of what, where we'll go from the um, photograph to the end piece. And it's always a bit of an abstraction because I sculpt better than I draw. Um, but what I'm trying to do is convey well enough um, where we're going to end up in glass. Um, and um, I think that it's a really a great experience. And what I'm trying to um, convey is the experience of seeing as we see. That we see this and then we take it to this and then we have to take it into wax and then we have to take it into glass and i think that that is not an experience that the collector gets often um, usually your first meeting with the piece is on a pedestal and you don't you don't get that sense of the process in the timeline i think these commissions sort of offer that experience Collector becomes part of this. Speak up. So, um, so I've been trying to do a little um, more detailed documentation. We're still trying to figure out how to do it because we don't think about it very often. But so I'm sort of taking you through um, the the uh, quickly through the development of the piece that you can see in the photo on the wall. And it starts as, you know, a couple, uh, as a lumps, essentially. And I'm just kind of constantly adding a little bit of refining, building, a bit at a time. It's like rolling big snakes in clay. My niece used to call it making wormies and balls. It's pretty much how you make sculptures and then moving up just you know constantly refining looking for the the right scale um this one was looked you know initially to me like sort of a simple piece but it actually turned up to be turned out to be quite challenging to get that twisting in there that they were doing and refining and refining Heads, 
sculpting little noses kind of drives me a little bit crazy, I, I will confess. And then, you know, starting to get some of the details sculpted in, moving up. Refining and refining and refining. Sometimes Steve comes in and I'm like, ah, I just keep picking and picking and picking. And knowing that moment when it's time to stop is sort of a, takes some, some experience as well. <laughs> So now I'm moving into the mold making phase. And um, so this is where I'm setting up the, the, um, the wax to be cast into the plaster. And so what you're seeing here is um, a series of, sprue of sprues. And so all of that red wax are sprues that I put at places where air might get trapped as the glass is flowing into the cavity of the mold. Um, the, the large um, brown thing on his butt is um, the port for feeding the glass into the, the cavity. This will be turned like that. It'll get turned like this <laughs> onto the mold board. And, um, and then all of those pieces of wax get um, sealed down to the board so that it doesn't float. Um, and then I put chicken wire around it, which helps um, hold the plaster together because, of course, it cracks and um, it would like to fall apart. Steve makes me a beautiful big box. And it gets filled with plaster. And, you know, this mold gets pretty big. It's a couple hundred pounds by this time. Um, and this is the steamer I was talking about. And so it's, it's sort of like a big lobster boil pot. Um, there is uh, water in the bottom and then we put a burner under it and boil the water, which creates steam that melts the wax out of the mold and catches it on top of the water so I can reuse it for 30 years, like I told you. Of course, there are hecklers involved <clears throat> and worry warts you have to weigh in on the process. And then um, Steve has to do a bunch of math, not my job. <laughs> and um, this, this is not this exact mold, but this is a sort of a typical um, setup in, in the mold where it's in the kiln. We fill this uh, flower pot full of the billets of glass and um, in a variety of ways, set it on top of the mold. I've also applied um, a layer of refractory cement around the plaster. Again, it's a little bit of cheap insurance just to you know, keep the mold from falling apart. Um, we think it works, but we don't wanna find out if it doesn't. <laughs> so, and you can see here, it's uh, Steve done, done his math. These are the billets, um, a, a type of billet that we use about this size. This is the fun part. That's just topping off what's already been put into the flower pot. And then um, it comes out and, you know, this is a rather delicate process, um, again, uh, through experience over the years, um, learning to be careful with that <coughs> big screwdriver. <laughs> It's easy to break off little heads, um, but it's just picking the wax away. I mean the, the plaster away. Um, from there, I, I don't have a slide of it, but from there I start grinding and cleaning and, and then I finish up, you can see the sandblaster in the back. And I finish up the surface with, um, by sandblasting and that takes out the scratches and homogenizes it. And then where there's painting involved, that's when the paint goes on. Um, and then, when it's all been really successful, you go to the, the photographer with your mask on. And here you have it. And so uh, this is the first complete one in the project. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, I um, have experienced through this 
project um, was um, a lot of storms. And I, we mentioned in the promo that um, it's been a very weird year for us. And, um, and indeed it has. Um, just as I was starting to uh, work on the waxes, um, sort of all hell broke loose with my mom. And uh, she needed to move from her big house into what we're calling her little trailer house, um, kind of right away. She, she turned 93 and started to be 93. And um, it ended up taking over our lives and we couldn't be in the studio for six months getting her settled, which was clearly the the most important thing but um it was a really um difficult time obviously from that point of view but as we were trying to to work um uh, in the beginning through it we were so distracted that we found we were starting to make mistakes and so we were having um, failures in the kiln and i was having to remake the pieces and you know, having to get back in contact with the collectors and tell them, well, you know, it didn't go well, so I'm gonna have to remake it and then get in contact with the collectors and tell them, oh, we're gonna have to take a break because we need to take care of my mom. And I can tell you, this is, um, we're not used to this and we're not used to these kind of mistakes. And, and it, then COVID is part of the tsunami. And then the COVID tsunami happened. And, uh, you know, I, I have to reveal it was, it was very embarrassing to go through. And then the thing that I really didn't expect was the generosity and the empathy and the understanding that we got from all of the collectors that we're working with, who all said, don't worry about it. There's no hurry. Take care of your mom. We can be patient. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> We're just looking forward to it. I had sent them all the um, original drawing, so as a placeholder, so that they could have that to look forward to. And um, the good news is that uh, mom is settled and she's healthy and she's very happy in her little place. And we um, completed the sale of her house um, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> and, and we're beginning to recuperate a little bit. We've got a couple pieces in the kiln. I've got more waxes started. And so um, it's been a, kind of an amazing tsunami to recover from. And um, we can only say thank you and um, express what an unexpected um, bonus that experience has been to work directly with the collectors in that way and just get that sort of generosity and um and understanding and so that brings us to the next ground floor project um, that we're going to uh, propose in the fall sometime and um this fall this fall and so we're just giving you a little sneak peek. Um, this experience of working directly with the collectors has, as I said, been, been really great. And so um, this time we're gonna um, call it Project Wind. And again, it's um, a recurring theme for us. Um, and so um, I'm going to um, share with you just a um, part of, uh, our inspiration, which is a quote from um, Catherine the Great, I think really appropriate right now, which is, a great wind is blowing and that gives you either imagination or a headache. And uh, so I think we're all faced with making that decision right now. So we're going for, an imag for imagination. So this is just a quick initial um, sketch that we're sort of thinking about the direction of what this might uh, this new project might go uh, go toward. And um, one of the things I want to talk about um, with these limited edition projects is they really give the collector the unique opportunity of coming in on the ground floor on, on their piece. And I think, you know, they need to know it's a warts and all process. Um, 
you have to, the collector has to fully use their imagination to be able to envision the final glass piece um, starting from a drawing. And they'll see as we see. They'll experience the real timeline of beginning to end. Something that, as I said, you don't really get to experience when you first meet the piece on a pedestal. And I'll be sending video updates as the, the pieces progress. And um, the, that'll really give a sense of um, every part of the process all along and kind of how long it takes. Participation. It's, you know, it's a, it's a different way of participating that I think really imbues the piece with um, a deeper story and um, really gives a rich vocabulary for the, the collector to tell the story of themselves within their collection. Um, but I have to say that the ground floor projects are not for everyone. They really take a lot of patience, perseverance, and trust. And I would really like to lie to you and say that everything goes perfectly all the time. But as this last year <laughs> reminded me, um, that's not the way it goes. And so um, I really expected to feel pressure to deliver, but I didn't ex expect the experience of um, having to go through the ups and downs with the collector. And um, it was really, as I said, it was, it was really gratifying. Um, their patience has been remarkable. And my promise is to deliver a sculpture that expresses and reflects that story within their lives and their collections. And so that again is um, what we will be proposing with um, Project Wind upcoming in the, the fall. And um, we have a couple of parting thoughts. Um, the pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. And the realist adjusts the sails. And here we are back to um, the sailor and the muse. An equilibrium. An equilibrium. Um, put on your, your face shirt when you're around a bunch of germy people and stay safe. And thanks again for joining us. Thank you guys. That was absolutely amazing. I really enjoyed it. If you want to stop sharing, uh, we can take some questions from everybody. Okay. And, uh, people are available, so yeah, feel free to ask. How long does it take you from the beginning imagination to the final product, uh, knowing that there will be unexpected issues? Well, the truth is, Myra, as I said, that um, there's never unexpected issues, except when you have a commission. <laughs> but it, you know, um, and uh, actually, um, one of the true answers to that is it depends on if, if there's a deadline for a show that drives it. But I would say, on average, we usually are um, at about um, six to eight weeks. Um, you know, kind of, de again, depending, but um, on average, I'd say six to eight weeks, is, you know, if all's going well and, um, and things go according to plan, that's, that's generally about what they'll take. Uh, I have a question. Uh, who did the uh, beautiful abstract paintings in your home? That is, go ahead, Steve. Those are, those are, uh, uh, 1960s Bay Area, San Francisco painter that my mom used to date. And when she passed away, they're mine. And uh, they're not Aztec, they're California hippie. <laughs> and they don't know the name of the artist. Yeah, the artist is Jack, uh, excuse me, Jack Foote. F-O-O-T-E, and we can find nothing about him. If you can, let us know. It, the, only, the only thing we found out um, it, is there was a, a, a sticker on the back of one of the paintings from a show that he participated in at the Birmingham um, Art Center in, in Michigan, um, down the street from, from the gallery. And I couldn't find, we haven't been able to find any more um 
information. Um, there was one other um, significant painting that you saw that was um, of a big head. And that one is by an artist um, who was um, Eric Rudans. And um, he was somebody that we knew in Tucson. And he's very interesting. Any, if there's any of, uh, knows who he is. He was actually in um, Madison uh, when Harvey Littleton started messing around with glass there and the glass program. And he was one of the um, original seven who were in there trying to sling some glass around. So that was sort of a roundabout connection to our glass world. And then Eric's became enlightened and said, I'm just gonna be a painter. <laughs> it's not so heavy to ship. <laughs> But he was, he was an amazing character, an amazing artist, yeah. Can you guys explain the flower, the flower pot part of your process? I didn't quite understand what that did. It's, we take a store-bought um, clay terracotta flower pot mm -hmm. that according to how much weight of glass I need to put in. And we drill out a larger hole in the bottom. And the flower pot sits up on a couple of stilts above the mold. And we load the glass into it cold and bring up the mold, the pot, and the glass up to temperature all at the same time. When the glass hits a certain degree, it starts melting and dropping through the hole. Ah, okay. And that's all inside of the kiln? Yes. Huh, it's just a funnel. It just acts essentially it's, as it's a, a funnel. It's a reservoir. Yeah. Gotcha. Now I understand. Yeah. Thank you guys. Any other questions? Um, Harry? Yeah. Is, is there, am I on? Can you hear me? Yep. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I think for me, one of the most exciting part of this program is your explanation of the process. Is it possible if someone commissions a piece of work for you to include a short video, maybe, of the process? And I don't know how, but to maybe have that video next to the piece, maybe on a battery operated apparatus, so that when someone comes by and looks at the piece, there's an explanation of this very delicate and wonderful process that you're, that you're creating here. Yes, actually, um, I've been doing that um, a little bit and then we're figuring out how to do it more. And so right. what I've been doing are some um, little video updates that I'm sending to the collector that sort of shows them where their piece is. And then um, we're just beginning to get a sense of how to um, record the process a little more completely. And then, um, yes, make a, um, some sort of a, a compilation uh, video or a little movie or, um, but yeah, we, we have that idea. And, um, and it's been um, really great to know how interested people are in, and again, you know, we think a lot about the story that the collector tells with their collection. Um, and we feel like our part of it, is, uh, our part in your collection is to help you tell your story. And so I, to enrich that story is, um, is really interesting and really fun for us to do. So yes, Charlene, we are actually thinking about that and um, to figuring out you know, how to do it, both technically and, um, and then just um, trying to remember <laughs> to, to take shots of ourselves. <laughs> All right, so if I want more information, how do I get in touch with you? Um, you with, through Habitat. We will, the, the, ground, the ground floor projects will be um, administered through Habitat. We'll work with them. I love it, really. Thank it's you. Great, nice and it's good. Thank you. All right, anybody else have any more questions to ask?
I have, a, I have a question. Sure. Corey? Um, I'm uh, Corey Hampson. Sorry that there's no image here. Corey who? Own, Wait, who? <laughs> How are you guys doing? <laughs> oh, I miss you. <laughs> We've been in quarantine here, um, and I've been uh, with Regina, my wife, and she's wanted to kill me just a few times. <laughs> working with each other and working on work about communication uh, with each other, I, I imagine is an inspiration. Tango series and other series that I've I've uh, watched on this video. I'm just curious. Over the 30 years you guys have been working with each other, how do you do it? How, How do, do we do, do it? it? Do you remember seeing a slide in, in the, uh, the initial video, the tour of our house and, and studio, and um, we've posted signs, um, one in each studio, and they say, no, you shut up. That's the entire secret to our success, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. It's all yours. You can take that one. You can steal it. You want us to make us make the signs for you? <laughs> um, I'm sure I'll read it, but I'm not going to say that. No, I, I, I'll leave that. <laughs> I have a question. And I know I sound just like Corey, but uh, it's for. I, who? <laughs> who is this again? Fred Thompson. Oh my God, they're yes. everywhere. <laughs> um, I noticed that you. Um, did not expose or show the African series whatsoever in your history. And um, I think I know why, but would you mention uh, why you didn't? Well, Seaford, now I'm mad at you because yeah, yeah, now, now, you're ta now you're talking about my age. You're referring to my age. Yeah. And because we only had an hour, there just wasn't time to go through my entire history. <laughs> Oh, okay, I understand now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ferd. <laughs> Thanks for that. God, I was trying to get away with it. I did my best with my makeup today, not to expose my real age. <laughs> if Ferd was to give a lecture, he wouldn't even mention that he had children. I think that right, that exactly. <laughs> Corey, who? <laughs> 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 any questions? Um, if anybody has any questions about the oh, this project, feel free to email me at Habitat, and I can keep on the update list as we come down with the plan and, and for the fall. I'm looking forward to working with the uh, on the ground the ground floor project. This the first one was very successful, and as you've heard, it's been a lot of fun to uh, work with Leah personally um, through this process. We here at Habitat are honored to have Leah and our Habitat family and are glad she was able to join us today. And uh, I now got my background up as you can see. And uh, <laughs> I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. And if you have any more questions, feel free or else we'll, we'll slowly end the meeting. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks for thank being you. here. Thank you. I can't wait to see you all again. Beautiful. Thank you, Beautiful. Thank you. Be well, stay safe. Take care, everybody. Thank, thank you for you. zooming in. Nice to finally see Steve. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Hello, Peter. Bye. No handcuffs work. I can't see. That's why they work. Hi, Janie. Bye, Janie. Good to see you. Bye. <laughs> He's gorgeous. Thank you. Bye, Bird. Bye, bye, Kathy. I miss you guys. Us too. Yeah. Take care, Steve and Leah. Thanks for Love coming, Bruce. <laughs> bye, guys. Thank you. Be safe, everybody. Bye bye.